young David, just a, a lad, a teenager, and he's speaking. He said, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with the sword and the spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now, of course, this is David speaking as he was facing the great giant Goliath. There's a battle going on between the Philistines on one side and the Israelites on the other. And this is symbolic of the battle that every young person must face here tonight, young and old. Because the Bible says in Galatians 5, 17, For the flesh lusteth or warreth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Inside of us we have two natures, a fleshly nature, a carnal nature, and a spiritual nature. And they're constantly at war inside of the believers especially. Now here is a battle going on. Here's the Valley of Elah. And on one side of the Israelites, the other side of the Philistines, and this great giant of a man is challenging the Israelites to a duel. You see, the Philistines picked out their strongest man. The Israelites were to pick out their strongest man, and whoever won, won the battle, won the war. Now that would just mean one person for each side. Now the Bible tells us how big Goliath was. He was nine feet, nine inches. He was clothed in heavy armor. He had a spear heavier than a weaver's beam, almost as big as a tree. He defied the armies of Israel for 40 days. Nobody had the courage to go out and fight Goliath. The men of Israel were afraid. They were trembling as they stood on their side of the valley. Now there's a small young man. When I say young man, he was probably 15 or 16 years of age. And he had been watching his father's sheep while his brothers were out with the armies. And so his father said to him one day, David, I want you to go visit your brothers and see how they're doing in the battle. And take these 10 loaves and 10 cheeses to them. And so David approaches the camp where they're camped. And he hears the challenge of Goliath, the giant, who says, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And David begins to ask questions. What in the world's going on? He said, who is this Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, you know, the world today faces some giants. We face giants of social injustice. We face the giants of wars that are being fought at this moment. We face the giants of AIDS that is about to wipe out one middle African country and is sweeping many parts of the world and no cure in sight. We face the giants of energy crisis, an ozone crisis, the greenhouse crisis, poverty, starvation in Africa that we read about, all of these things are giants that the world faces right now. And we need God's help. We cannot solve these problems ourselves. And then there are individual giants that you face in your life. Young people today face giants. They have to battle with these giants every day. One of them is a desire for acceptance or peer pressure. The identity crisis status to be recognized and all young people have this problem especially in school the peer pressure on you is so great to take that smoke or to take that crack just one dose of crack and you're hooked for life and there seems to be no cure to it and it's sweeping the country and the drug problem is just like an invasion of an enemy army except it's far worse and we're at war whether we like it or not with drugs. And then young people have a longing for security. That's another giant that you face. While young people may be rebelling, they actually are wanting authority in their lives. You see, we were built for authority. Some philosophy will ultimately master you. Some ideology is going to direct your life. You're going to give yourself to someone or something to believe in. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. He said again in John 13, 13, you call me master and Lord for so I am. In Christ, there can 
be the authority that you've been searching for. Whether you like it or not, you really want authority. And that's one of the reasons many young people rebel. I can understand why they rebel against some of the parents that I see interviewed on television. Because they're not worthy to be parents. But there's also among young people a hunger to be loved. An American juvenile judge said some time ago, I've never had a wayward girl before me who was loved by her father. Joseph Goebbels was Hitler's propaganda minister and had almost as much to do with Hitler's rise to power as anyone else. He was a PhD from Heidelberg University, a very intellectual man, as were many of the Nazis. And yet he had polio and he limped as he walked and young people in the school would make fun of him. They called him the limping louse and people didn't love him. They weren't attracted to him until one day this little man from Austria came along and put his arm around him and loved him and gave him a place and made him feel accepted and wanted. And he gave his life to Nazism. God does that for you. He comes and puts his arms around you and loves you. And he says, you can find a place with me. He that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him, the scripture says. And he proved his love by giving his son to die for us on the cross. The apostle John said, behold, what manner of love the father hath bestowed upon us. And the thing that I said yesterday, I'd like to repeat tonight. If you get nothing out of these meetings, out of this mission, I hope that you will remember that God loves you. He's interested in you. He has every hair of your head numbered. You are an individual before God whom he loves. And if you had been the only person in the whole world, his son would have died on the cross for you. Yes, he can be the authority. He can be the love. And then another giant that young people face is the problem of sex. A 24-year-old woman, a nice girl, a quiet social work student who wanted little more from life than to fall in love and someday have a family of her own. When she got involved with an older man in what she says was her first sexual relationship, the prospect of AIDS never even occurred to her. The relationship has been over now for two years, but she has been diagnosed as having AIDS-related complex. In the beginning, she says, I thought a lot about suicide. I thought, here I am. I just finished college. I'm ready to begin my life, and it's already all over. You see, sex is not a sin. Certain types of lust are a sin. There's certain types of lust that are not sin, because lust means desire. Desire to do the best you can is not sin, but when you desire something that is wrong, you see, man has taken something good and holy and corrupted it, and God's great gift has been perverted. And why does God say, thou shalt not commit adultery? Why does he say that? Does he not want us to have a good time? He does it to protect marriage. He does it to protect your body. He does it to protect you psychologically. Because you see, psychologically, you have that sense of guilt and emotional disturbances and insecurity and you feel unloved. How can you face the giant of sex? Young people today, young men, they reach their peak at about 18 to 22 in their sexual desire. Women a little bit later, but all have it. It's a gift from God, but we've perverted it and we've misused it. And now we're beginning to pay for it in these terrible diseases and other things that are sweeping many parts of the world. How can you face this giant, this urge, this passion that you have and still be true to God and still be clean and pure? There's no way, not in the modern day, except you have Christ in your heart who will give you supernatural power to resist and to say no and to be pure and to practice chastity.
The marks of a Christian are self-control and self-discipline. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, keep yourself pure. He said, flee youthful lust. He also said concerning himself, he said, I keep my own body under obedience and discipline and bring it into subjection. You can do that too with Christ's help. If he's your master and your Lord, you can control this powerful energy that you have and that God has given for a purpose. We wouldn't have the propagation of the race. Somebody asked me, why did God give us sex? I said, I wouldn't be here were it not for sex, and neither would you. It's a gift from God, for, but inside of marriage, inside certain parameters, and we're to keep those parameters. And there's no joy, and there's no thrill, and there's no love, and there's no excitement, and there's no passion comparable to sex within marriage. Sex within marriage between two believers is a marvelous thing. Yes, there are spiritual forces of evil in the world. There are spiritual forces of good in the world. And on one side is God. On the other side is the tempter, the devil, Satan. And there's a great battle going on in our world, and that battle is going on inside you too. And there's only one way to withstand the giants and to conquer the foe. Now notice that David was out experienced. He'd never been in a battle. He was outnumbered because the giant Goliath had an armor bearer. He was outarmed. David had nothing but his slingshot. He was outweighed. And David said to Goliath, You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God and the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. David had nothing but his faith in God. And you and I must go out with our faith in God, daily Bible reading and prayer to meet the enemy that we must meet every day and every hour of every day. There's no let up. Satan never lets up. David went out clothed in the arm of God, depending on God and trusting in God. And David gets his sling and he stoops and he chooses in the, in the little brook that was between the two armies, he chooses five round stones. Somebody says, why did he choose five? He only needed one. Well, there's a passage in 2 Samuel 21, 22 that says he had, that Goliath had four sons. And whether he was his sons or his brothers, David expected that as soon as he got through with Goliath, he'd have four of his family to deal with. And they might be giants too. And he was going to get ready for all of them. Now, five stones that you as young people ought to take with you. You take a personal faith in Christ. Notice personal. David had a personal relationship with God. And then a daily devotional life. And then a disciplined life. And a dedication to the service of other people. And preparedness. David had those, you can have those five stones in your little bag. A personal faith in Christ. A daily devotional life a disciplined life, a dedication to the service of other people, and your preparedness, and you're ready to do battle with the enemy every day. Lincoln once said, I will prepare and someday my chance will come. You get prepared and someday your chance will come. And so the giant Goliath laughs and sneers and taunts David. And David said to him, this day will the Lord deliver you into my hand. And so David took his sling and he threw the stone and it went right into the forehead of Goliath. And to the amazement of everyone, both Philistines and Israelites, he fell down dead. David didn't have a sword. So he reached over and he took Goliath's great big sword and he severed his head and took that head in his hand and carried it back to the armies of Israel. And the armies of Israel began to pursue the Philistines as the Philistines fled and they won the battle that day because one young boy had faith enough to believe in God that God could do anything. And this young man had prepared in his youth. He'd made his decision as a boy to serve God at any cost. 
He made his decision to meditate on God night and day. He made his decision to live for God, to live a life of purity before God in the strength of God. He knew he didn't have the strength, but with yielding to God, God would give him the strength. And in the same way, you cannot face the giants alone. You need Christ, and you can receive Christ into your heart tonight, or you can rededicate your life to him tonight. I'm going to ask you to do that. We saw yesterday over 1,500 do what I'm going to ask you to do now. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this stand and say by coming, I do open my heart to Christ as Lord and Master and Savior. I want him to forgive my past sins. I want to receive him into my heart now. I want to follow him and serve him. I'd like to be a David where I am. You may be an older man. You may be a young man, a young woman, father, mother, young person. You get up and come. The Bible says, now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. For many of you, you may never be this close to the kingdom of God again. This is your moment. There's a passage in, the, in 1 Samuel 17, 47 that says this, and this is David, young David, just a, a lad, a teenager, and he's speaking. He said, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with the sword and the spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now, of course, this is David speaking as he was facing the great giant, Goliath. There's a battle going on between the Philistines on one side and the Israelites on the other. And this is symbolic of the battle that every young person must face here tonight, young and old. Because the Bible says in Galatians 5, 17, For the flesh lusteth or warreth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Inside of us, we have two natures, a fleshly nature, a carnal nature, and a spiritual nature. And they're constantly at war inside of the believers especially. Now here is a battle going on. Here's the Valley of Elah. And on one side of the Israelites, the other side of the Philistines, and this great giant of a man is challenging the Israelites to a duel. You see, the Philistines picked out their strongest man. The Israelites were to pick out their strongest man, and whoever won, won the battle, won the war. Now, that would just mean one person for each side. Now, the Bible tells us how big Goliath was. He was nine feet, nine inches. He was clothed in heavy armor. He had a spear heavier than a weaver's beam, almost as big as a tree. He defied the armies of Israel for 40 days. Nobody had the courage to go out and fight Goliath. The men of Israel were afraid. They were trembling as they stood on their side of the valley. Now there's a small young man. When I say young man, he was probably 15 or 16 years of age. And he had been watching his father's sheep while his brothers were out with the armies. And so his father said to him one day, David, I want you to go visit your brothers and see how they're doing in the battle and take these 10 loaves and 10 cheeses to them. And so David approaches the camp where they're camped and he hears the challenge of Goliath, the giant, who says, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And David begins to ask questions. What in the world's going on? He said, who is this Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, you know, the world today faces some giants. We face giants of social injustice. We face the giants of wars that are being fought at this moment. We face the giants of AIDS that is about to wipe out one middle African country and is sweeping many parts of the world and no cure in sight. We face the giants of energy crisis, an ozone crisis, 
the greenhouse crisis, poverty, starvation in Africa that we read about, all of these things are giants that the world faces right now. And we need God's help. We cannot solve these problems ourselves. And then there are individual giants that you face in your life. Young people today face giants. They have to battle with these giants every day. One of them is a desire for acceptance or peer pressure. The identity crisis, status to be recognized. And all young people have this problem, especially in school. The peer pressure on you is so great to take that smoke or to take that crack. Just one dose of crack and you're hooked for life. And there seems to be no cure to it. It's sweeping the country. And the drug problem is just like an invasion of an enemy army, except it's far worse. And we're at war, whether we like it or not, with drugs. And then young people have a longing for security. That's another giant that you face. While young people may be rebelling, they actually are wanting authority in their lives. You see, we were built for authority. Some philosophy will ultimately master you. Some ideology is going to direct your life. You're going to give yourself to someone or something to believe in. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. He said again in John 13, 13, you call me master and Lord for so I am. In Christ, there can be the authority that you've been searching for. Whether you like it or not, you really want authority. And that's one of the reasons many young people rebel. I can understand why they rebel against some of the parents that I see interviewed on television. Because they're not worthy to be parents. But there's also among young people a hunger to be loved. An American juvenile judge said some time ago, I've never had a wayward girl before me who was loved by her father. Joseph Goebbels was Hitler's propaganda minister and had almost as much to do with Hitler's rise to power as anyone else. He was a PhD from Heidelberg University, a very intellectual man, as were many of the Nazis. And yet he had polio and he limped as he walked and young people in the school would make fun of him. They called him the limping louse and people didn't love him. They weren't attracted to him until one day this little man from Austria came along and put his arm around him and loved him and gave him a place and made him feel accepted and wanted. And he gave his life to Nazism. God does that for you. He comes and puts his arms around you and loves you. And he says, you can find a place with me. He that loveth me shall be loved of my father and I will love him, the scripture says. And he proved his love by giving his son to die for us on the cross. The apostle John said, behold what manner of love the father hath bestowed upon us. And the thing that I said yesterday, I'd like to repeat tonight. If you get nothing out of these meetings, out of this mission, I hope that you will remember that God loves you. He's interested in you. He has every hair of your head numbered. You are an individual before God whom he loves. And if you had been the only person in the whole world, his son would have died on the cross for you. Yes, he can be the authority. He can be the love. And then another giant that young people face is the problem of sex. A 24-year-old woman, a nice girl, a quiet social work student who wanted little more from life than to fall in love and someday have a family of her own. When she got involved with an older man in what she says was her first sexual relationship, the prospect of AIDS never even occurred to her. The relationship has been over now for two years, but she has been diagnosed as having AIDS-related complex. In the beginning, she says, I thought a lot about suicide. I thought, here I am. I just finished college. I'm ready to begin my life, and it's already all over. You see, sex is not a sin. Certain types of lust are a sin. There's certain types of lust that are not sin, because lust means desire. Desire to do the best you can is not 
sin, but when you desire something that is wrong, you see, man has taken something good and holy and corrupted it, and God's great gift has been perverted. And why does God say, thou shalt not commit adultery? Why does he say that? Does he not want us to have a good time? He does it to protect marriage. He does it to protect your body. He does it to protect you psychologically. Because you see, psychologically, you have that sense of guilt and emotional disturbances and insecurity, and you feel unloved. How can you face the giant of sex? Young people today, young men, they reach their peak at about 18 to 22 in their sexual desire, women a little bit later, but all have it. It's a gift from God, but we've perverted it and we've misused it. And now we're beginning to pay for it in these terrible diseases and other things that are sweeping many parts of the world. How can you face this giant, this urge, this passion that you have and still be true to God and still be clean and pure? There's no way, not in the modern day, except you have Christ in your heart who will give you supernatural power to resist and to say no and to be pure and to practice chastity. The marks of a Christian are self-control and self-discipline. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, keep yourself pure. He said, flee youthful lust. He also said concerning himself, he said, I keep my own body under obedience and discipline and bring it into subjection. You can do that too with Christ's help. If he's your master and your Lord, you can control this powerful energy that you have and that God has given for a purpose. We wouldn't have the propagation of the race. Somebody asked me, why did God give us sex? I said, I wouldn't be here were it not for sex, and neither would you. It's a gift from God, for, but inside of marriage, inside certain parameters, and we're to keep those parameters. And there's no joy, and there's no thrill, and there's no love, and there's no excitement, and there's no passion comparable to sex within marriage. Sex within marriage between two believers is a marvelous thing. Yes, there are spiritual forces of evil in the world. There are spiritual forces of good in the world. And on one side is God. On the other side is the tempter, the devil, Satan. And there's a great battle going on in our world, and that battle is going on inside you too. And there's only one way to withstand the giants and to conquer the foe. Now notice that David was out experienced. He'd never been in a battle. He was outnumbered because the giant Goliath had an armor bearer. He was outarmed. David had nothing but his slingshot. He was outweighed. And David said to Goliath, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God and the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. David had nothing but his faith in God. And you and I must go out with our faith in God, daily Bible reading and prayer to meet the enemy that we must meet every day and every hour of every day. There's no let up. Satan never lets up. David went out clothed in the arm of God, depending on God and trusting in God. And David gets his sling and he stoops and he chooses in the, in the little brook that was between the two armies, he chooses five round stones. Somebody says, why did he choose five? He only needed one. Well, there's a passage in 2 Samuel 21, 22 that says he had, that Goliath had four sons. And whether he was his sons or his brothers, David expected that as soon as he got through with Goliath, he'd have four of his family to deal with. And they might be giants too. And he was going to get ready for all of them. Now, five stones that you as young people ought to take with you. You take a personal faith in Christ. Notice personal. David had a personal relationship with God. 
and then a daily devotional life, and then a disciplined life, and a dedication to the service of other people, and preparedness. David had those, you can have those five stones in your little bag. A personal faith in Christ, a daily devotional life, a disciplined life, a dedication to the service of other people, and your preparedness, and you're ready to do battle with the enemy every day. Lincoln once said, I will prepare and someday my chance will come. You get prepared and someday your chance will come. And so the giant Goliath laughs and sneers and taunts David. And David said to him, This day will the Lord deliver you into my hand. And so David took his sling and he threw the stone and it went right into the forehead of Goliath. And to the amazement of everyone, both Philistines and Israelites, he fell down dead. David didn't have a sword. So he reached over and he took Goliath's great big sword and he severed his head and took that head in his hand and carried it back to the armies of Israel. And the armies of Israel began to pursue the Philistines as the Philistines fled and they won the battle that day because one young boy had faith enough to believe in God that God could do anything. And this young man had prepared in his youth. He'd made his decision as a boy to serve God at any cost. He made his decision to meditate on God night and day. He made his decision to live for God, to live a life of purity before God in the strength of God. He knew he didn't have the strength, but with yielding to God, God would give him the strength. And in the same way, you cannot face the giants alone. You need Christ, and you can receive Christ into your heart tonight, or you can rededicate your life to him tonight. I'm going to ask you to do that. We saw yesterday over 1,500 do what I'm going to ask you to do now. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the stand and say by coming, I do open my heart to Christ as Lord and Master and Savior. I want him to forgive my past sins. I want to receive him into my heart now. I want to follow him and serve him. I'd like to be a David where I am. You may be an older man. You may be a young man, a young woman, father, mother, young person. You get up and come. The Bible says, now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. For many of you, you may never be this close to the kingdom of God again. This is your moment. turn with me to a passage of scripture that everybody knows. It's the easiest passage and the one that almost everyone has memorized in the New Testament. John 3:16. It was the first passage of scripture that I ever memorized as a boy. My mother taught it to me while she was giving me a bath once. And this is the passage. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I want us all to say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Last year, the number one motion picture in the United States and I suppose throughout the world that drew the largest box office was a motion picture that was made just for a small amount of money. Nobody ever thought it would amount to much. It was based upon a simple little story and it was called Love Story. And then last year, the Duke of Windsor died and a headline in the British papers said the greatest love story of the century. But the greatest love story of all time is summed up in these 25 verses of 25 words that someone is called a miniature Bible, the gospel in a nutshell. For God so loved the world that he gave 
his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The greatest love story ever told. For God. Do you ever stop and think about God? Many people are thinking about God today because we've seen that science does not have an answer to all of our problems. We are seeing that technology cannot solve all of our problems. And so thousands of young people in Europe and in America are beginning to talk about God. Some of them are going to India to see if they can find peace in their hearts. Some of them are going and studying yoga. And they're going into all sorts of different sects and groups searching for God. Some of them are going out into the desert and sitting under the stars and watching the stars. Have you ever wondered about God? Someone asked me at a university one day, can you prove God exists? And I answered, no. I cannot put God in a test tube. I cannot put God in a laboratory and say, here's God. How do I know that God exists? All the evidence seems to indicate that he does. I look up in the starry sky and I say, there must be a God. I look at the beautiful nature round about me and I say, there must be a God. I see the birth of a baby. Gary Player was telling us yesterday how he saw the birth of his last child. And he said, as I watched that, I knew that there had to be a God. But there's another reason. Deep in your heart, you have a conscience. And your conscience tells you there must be a God. Something down inside tells me there must be a God. And the Bible tells us that this God is the creator of all the universe. In Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now in that passage in Genesis 1, there is no explanation there's no attempt to prove God. It just says, in the beginning, God. Because everybody believes in God. Oh, but you say, I've met some atheists. You met some atheists that hadn't had any real trouble yet. But you find a person who claims he's an atheist and let someone announce to him that he has terminal cancer, and you'll say, my God, help me. Or he get into a battle or get into a difficult spot, he'll say, my God, help me. I remember Mr. Khrushchev was touring the United States and, of course, being the head of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union, he didn't believe in God. But one day he let slip several things. He quoted several passages of Scripture and he called them old Russian sayings. And then he said, may God have mercy upon you. Then he caught himself and he said, of course, I don't believe in God. But you see, down inside, something in Mr. Khrushchev was saying, you believe in God. Yes, all men know that there must be a God. He is the creator. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. Now the Bible tells us God is a spirit. God doesn't have a body like yours. If God had a body like yours, he would have to be in one place at one time. But God doesn't have a body like yours. God is a spirit. And God can be in Africa. He can be in Asia. He can be in Europe. He can be in America all at the same time. He can be on a planet. He can be on the moon at the same time. I've talked to some of those astronauts that went to the moon. And they told me that they knew as they went around the moon, there must be a God. I talked to some of the prisoners of war from Vietnam just a few days before I came on this trip. I talked to those first prisoners that came back to the United States. And they told us in those prison cells for eight years in Vietnam, they knew there was a God. God is a spirit. The Bible tells us that God is unchanging. He never changes. Fashions change. Every part of our culture and life changes. And vast changes are underway throughout the world. And South Africa is finding that she can no longer live isolated from the rest of the world. Neither can we in America. And the great problems that we face are under tremendous pressure from world public opinion. The jet plane, modern communications have made it impossible. Fashions change, culture changes, technology changes, but God never changes. 
The Bible says, I am the Lord God, I change not. The Bible says, there is no variableness, no shadow of turning with God. God has not changed in thousands of years. 10,000 times 10,000 years from now, God will be the same. God is from everlasting to everlasting. God does not change. The Bible also tells us that God is a holy God. Absolutely holy. The Bible says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. Thou canst not look on iniquity. God is holy and righteous. And you'll never understand God. You'll never understand about God and God's dealing with us until you understand that God is absolutely pure and God is absolutely holy and God cannot even look upon sin with any approval whatsoever. And then the Bible tells us that God is a God of judgment. In Ecclesiastes 12, 14, the Bible says, God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. There's a judgment day coming. You're going to be there if you're outside of Christ. And every secret thing will be brought to light. Everything that you hid, everything that you did that you didn't think anybody knew about, all of your thoughts, all of your motives, all of your intents, all of your actions are on God's computers. And God is keeping a record. And someday, you're going to have to stand before a holy God and give an account at the great judgment day. Jesus said, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof on the day of judgment. The apostle Paul said in his great sermon at Athens, he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world by that man, Christ Jesus. There's a day of judgment coming. He has appointed a day. It's all set. You're going to be there. And every secret thing that you've ever thought or done will be flashed on the scoreboards up in heaven at the judgment. And the whole world will see what you really were down inside. God is a God of judgment. But the Bible also teaches that God is a God of love. That God loves I'm glad that's in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. That God is a God of love and mercy and grace. And that God loves everybody. I don't care who you are. He has the hairs of your head numbered. He sees the sparrow fall. He's interested in you. And he loves you. Now, there are several Greek words that are translated love. Eros means sensual love, sexual love. Phileo means friendship love, the love that I would have for a friend. But when the writers of the New Testament were trying to find a word that would describe the love of God, they invented a new word, agape, the divine love, a love that we cannot know outside of God. There is no love that you can think of in human relationships comparable to the love that God has for you and that God has for me. God loves you. You say, but Billy, I don't deserve such love. I'm a sinner. I've broken God's law. I failed him a thousand times. I know. That's the beauty and the greatness and the thrill of God's love. That no matter what you've done, he loves you. For God so loved the world, the black world, the white world the yellow world, the red world, the rich world, the poor world, the uneducated world, the educated world, and he loves us all the same. God loves you. And God loved us so much that he gave his son. Now, why did he have to give his son? What happened? What tragedy? What disaster came upon the human race? The Bible tells us that God created you created man. He put him in paradise. He put him in utopia. And God gave to man a gift he did not give to his other creatures. God created us in his image. Not in the physical image of God, but in the spiritual image. We have a moral nature and we have the right to choose. 
And God said, I'm going to give you everything in the world for your happiness. But there's one tree over here that I don't want you to touch because I've given you the freedom of choice. I want you to choose me because you want to. I want you to love me and serve me because you want to serve me. You want to love me. I don't want you to do it because I make you. I've given you the tremendous responsibility of freedom of choice. So I put a tree here, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou shalt eat thereof, thou shalt die. What happened? Man looked at the tree. He looked at the fruit. He saw it was an unusual fruit. Probably had a magnificent taste. The devil was there in the form of a serpent to tempt him. And the Bible says that man broke the law of God. Man rebelled against God. Man failed the test. And man made his own deliberate choice. God said, in the day that you eat it, in the day that you rebel against me, in the day that you break this law of the Garden of Eden, you shall die. God had to keep his word. Man had to die, or God would not be holy. So from that moment on, man began to die. He died physically, he died spiritually, he died eternally. And all the troubles and all the problems of the world down through history have come from that great disaster because all of us are the sons of Adam. All of our prejudices, all of our hates, all of our fightings, all of our bickerings, all of our jealousies, all of our pride, everything that troubles the human race today came from the fact that we have rebelled against God and we're all guilty. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, the Bible says. You have sinned. I have sinned. We are guilty. Pascal once said, in seeking to become angels, we have become less than men. Carl Jung, the great psychologist, once said, it is becoming more and more obvious that our problems are not social. He said it's not starvation, it's not cancer, but man himself who is mankind's greatest danger. Bertrand Russell once said, it is in our hearts that the evil lies. It's in our hearts. That's what Jesus taught, that our problems lie in our hearts because Jesus said, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, thefts, false witness, blasphemy. Jesus said, your problem is a heart problem. The Apostle Paul said, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. There's a mystery about it. None of us really knows exactly where the devil came from. I'm writing a book right now on the devil. I've been doing a lot of research for 18 months on the subject. We don't know for sure exactly how the devil came, but we know that he's a factor. We know that he is there, tempting and pulling and trying us and attacking us and harassing us at every turn. And we know that mankind made the fateful choice in Adam to follow the devil instead of God. But the Bible says in spite of our rebellion, in spite of our sins, God loves us. And God gave his only son. Now the Bible says the wages of sin, the result of sin is death. What kind of death? Well, you go out here and you see the cemeteries and you know that people die physically. Yes, we're all going to die. In a hundred years, every person in this audience will be dead. Perhaps in 50 years, we'll all be dead. Everybody will be dead. I'm 54 years of age. The most of my life has already been lived. I know that I'm going to die unless Christ comes first. I know that I'm going to die. It's appointed unto man once to die. That's a result of sin that has infected the whole human race. Then there's spiritual death. What is spiritual death? Well, spiritual death is where you are alive in a sense, but you're also dead. And that's why you find movie stars who reach the top 
the sex symbols like Marilyn Monroe. Many of them commit suicide. Many of them are unhappy. Why? Because they thought that if they had power and fame and money, they'd be happy. But they're not happy. Why? Because spiritually, your soul, made in the image of God, is separated from God, and your soul keeps crying out for God. And you say, well, if I make a little more money, maybe my soul will be happy. Or if I get a little more power, or if I have a little more influence, I'll be happy. But the trouble is, you're not happy. You see, you want more. And you don't get that certain something that you're always looking for. It's always elusive. It's always out there in the future somewhere. Why? Because your soul is searching for God. And your soul made in the image of God says, I want God. And St. Augustine said, it's restless till it finds God. And until you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and receive him into your heart, you'll always be questing and looking and trying to find, but you won't be able to find. Then there's a third death, and that's called eternal death. That's what Jesus called hell. He used the word lost, perish, condemn, hell, punishment. Whatever it is, it is separation from God because of our sins. And the Bible indicates that Jesus believed that there was a future world, there was a future heaven, and a future hell. Now, in the midst of all that, God says, I love man so much, I want to save him. So what did God do? God devised a magnificent plan to redeem you, to save you. He decided to come to earth and to become a man. And that's who Jesus Christ was. Jesus Christ did not have a human father. He was born of the Virgin Mary. Mary couldn't have been more than about 16 or 17 years of age. And she became pregnant not by a man, but by the Holy Spirit. And she gave birth to a baby. And that baby grew up and he began to teach. And what a person he was. He was only able to teach and heal and feed people for three years. And they crucified him. The Romans took him outside the city walls of Jerusalem. They beat him until his back bled. They put a crown of thorns on his brow and his face bled. They pulled his beard out. They put spikes in his hands. And while they were doing that, 72,000 angels pulled their swords ready to come and sweep this planet into hell. And Jesus said, no, I love them too much. I will bear the hell. I will bear the judgment on the cross for their sins. And Jesus Christ hung there between heaven and earth and in some mysterious way that I do not understand. God took your sin and your sin and your sin and my sin and laid them on Christ. And in that dreadful moment, we get a glimpse of what was happening because our Lord exclaimed, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in that terrible agonizing moment, he was bearing your sins and my sins. He took the death and the hell and the judgment and the sin that I deserved, he took on that cross. The Bible says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Isaiah the prophet had prophesied, the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Paul said, you have made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He was made sin. Jesus Christ became guilty of adultery of murder, of robbery, of hate, of prejudice. On that cross, he took our sins. He who had never known a sin took our sins and became sin. He became sin for us. And they took his body away and laid him in a grave. But he didn't stay there. The Bible says, on the third day, he arose again. And Jesus Christ at this moment is alive. Right now, he's a living savior. And when they went out to see his body, the angel said, he is not here. 
for he is risen. And the greatest words that were ever given in the language of men was he is not here, he is risen. Jesus is alive right now. And he's ready to come into your heart and receive you and receive you into him self so that he will abide in you and you will abide in him if you put your faith and your trust and your confidence in him now that's not the end of the story because god has another plan god's plan is to send jesus christ back to this earth again when is it going to take place we don't know but i believe that there are signs in the scriptures that would indicate that his coming is relatively soon it may be tomorrow. It may be a thousand years from now. We do not know. But we know that the Bible is filled with passages that indicate that he's coming back. And we are going to have utopia. We are going to have world peace. The lion and the lamb will lie down together. Justice will sweep the earth. And there's coming a day when the dream that Martin Luther King gave in Washington will come true when all prejudice will be gone and men will have love for each other. But till that time, we're called upon to do the best we can dealing with fallen human nature. We can patch up problems here and patch up problems there and patch up problems everywhere. And we spend all of our time patching up problems. And now we have atomic bombs in our hands ready to throw at each other. But Jesus is coming back. And the next time he comes, it will be as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. The Bible says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. I'm looking forward to hearing that shout. I get tired sometimes and I get weary. And I sometimes say, Lord, I wish you were today. Sometimes the pressures are too great and sometimes the burdens of life are too great. And I find myself praying in the middle of the night, Lord, let it be at sunrise tomorrow. I'm ready to go. I want to go. I'm looking forward to heaven. And I'm living in hope and anticipation of that glorious tomorrow in which there'll be no sunset and no darkness. And the streets will be paved with gold. And the fruit trees will bear 12 crops a year. And everybody will have plenty to eat and there'll be no poverty in the world. What a wonderful time that's going to be. But now, at this moment in this stadium, and on this radio, God the Holy Spirit has spoken to you. The gospel is never preached without the working and the operation of the Holy Spirit. You see, there's a little voice that's been speaking to you while I'm speaking. That's the voice of the Spirit of God. And God has been convicting you of your sin, and God has been convicting you of your need of Jesus Christ. Oh, I know that the majority of you may be members of the church. When I came to Christ many years ago, I was a member of the church. I was the president of the Young People's Society in my church. Everybody thought I was a wonderful Christian. But deep in my heart, I did not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, God loves you. He's given his son. What do you have to do? You have to do something. What is it? First, you have to repent of your sins. Jesus said, repent ye. The Apostle Paul said, God now commanded all men everywhere to repent. God commands you to repent. Have you ever repented of your sin? Do you remember the moment when you repented? You say, well, Billy, what do you really mean by repent? Well, first of all, repentance carries with it the idea that you say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. Have you ever said that to God? I'm sorry and you really meant it? And then it means that you have to change. You have to turn around. You have to change and quit doing your sins. Change your way of living. Old things pass away and everything becomes new. That's repentance. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to turn from my sin. Have you ever repented? Jesus said, except you repent, you will perish. And then secondly, by faith, you must receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. That can all be done with repentance. Repentance and faith go hand in hand. You may not understand it all intellectually. You don't have to. You come by simple childlike faith. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. The Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. 
Now, that doesn't mean you do away with your intellect or commit intellectual suicide. Oh, no, there's a logic to the gospel. But your mind has been affected by sin so that you can no longer really receive spiritual things. So you come by faith and receive him. And then the third thing, you must openly confess him as your Lord and Savior and Master. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. Now that's why I ask people to come forward in these crusades. I ask you to openly confess Christ. All over the world, throughout Japan, throughout America, in the great stadiums of Great Britain and all over Europe, I've seen thousands of people do what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat wherever you are and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I know that I'm a sinner. I receive Christ into my heart. I want my sins forgiven. I want to know that I'm going to heaven. I want a new life in Jesus Christ. You say, Billy, that's a hard thing for me to do, to get up and come in front of everybody. I know. But Jesus hung on that cross in front of a shouting crowd that was spitting at him and laughing at him and mocking him. He died publicly. And not a single place in the New Testament do you find that Jesus ever called anybody privately. It's always publicly that he called them. And there's a reason for that. A psychological reason, a spiritual reason, a scriptural reason. You say, but how would I ever get through this crowd? I know it's going to be difficult, so I'm going to ask the crowd to help us. I'm going to ask you not to move where you are. Just stay where you are, quiet, reverent, with bowed heads. And I'm going to ask men and women and young people to get up and come and stand in front of the platform and back of the platform here and all around. Just stand here. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you, have a prayer with you, give you some verses of scripture and some literature, and you can go back and join your friends. And if you're with friends,